The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion, read by the author, Jonathan Haidt. Can we all get along? That appeal was made famous on May 1st, 1992, by Rodney King, a black man who had been beaten nearly to death by four Los Angeles police officers a year earlier. The entire nation had seen a videotape of the beating, so when a jury failed to convict the officers, their acquittal triggered widespread outrage and six days of rioting in Los Angeles. 53 people were killed, and more than 7,000 buildings were torched. Much of the mayhem was carried live. News cameras tracked the action from helicopters circling overhead. After a particularly horrific act of violence against a white truck driver, King was moved to make his appeal for peace. King's appeal is now so overused that it has become cultural kitsch, a catchphrase more often said for laughs than as a serious plea for mutual understanding. I therefore hesitated to use King's words as the opening line of this book, but I decided to go ahead for two reasons. The first is because most Americans nowadays are asking King's question not about race relations, but about political relations and the collapse of cooperation across party lines. Many Americans feel as though the nightly news from Washington is being sent to us from helicopters circling over the city, delivering dispatches from the war zone. The second reason I decided to open this book with an overused phrase is because King followed it up with something lovely, something rarely quoted. As he stumbled through his television interview, fighting back tears and often repeating himself, he found these words. Please, we can get along here. We all can get along. I mean, we're all stuck here for a while. Let's try to work it out. This book is about why it's so hard for us to get along. We are indeed all stuck here for a while, so let's at least do what we can to understand why we're so easily divided into hostile groups, each one certain of its righteousness. People who devote their lives to studying something often come to believe that the object of their fascination is the key to understanding everything. Books have been published in recent years on the transformative role in human history played by cooking, mothering, war, even salt. This is one of those books. I study moral psychology, and I'm going to make the case that morality is the extraordinary human capacity that made civilization possible. I don't mean to imply that cooking, mothering, war, and salt were not also necessary, but in this book I'm going to take you on a tour of human nature and history from the perspective of moral psychology. By the end of the tour, I hope to have given you a new way to think about two of the most important, vexing, and divisive topics in human life, politics and religion. Etiquette books tell us not to discuss these topics in polite company, but I say, go ahead. Politics and religion are both expressions of our underlying moral psychology, and an understanding of that psychology can help to bring people together. My goal in this book is to drain some of the heat, anger, and divisiveness out of these topics and replace them with awe, wonder, and curiosity. We are downright lucky that we evolved this complex moral psychology that allowed our species to burst out of the forests and savannas and into the delights, comforts, and extraordinary peacefulness of modern society in just a few thousand years. My hope is that this book will make conversations about morality, politics, and religion more common, more civil, and more fun, even in mixed company. My hope is that it will help us to get along. Born to be Righteous I could have titled this book The Moral Mind to convey the sense that the human mind is designed to do morality, just as it's designed to do language, sexuality, music, and many other things described in popular books reporting the latest scientific findings. But I chose the title The Righteous Mind to convey the sense that human nature is not just intrinsically moral, it's also intrinsically moralistic, critical, and judgmental. The word righteous comes from the old Norse word retvis and the old English word reitvis, both of which mean just, upright, virtuous. This meaning has been carried into the modern English words righteous and righteousness, although nowadays those words have strong religious connotations because they are usually used to translate the Hebrew word tzedek. Tzedek is a common word in the Hebrew Bible, often used to describe people who act in accordance with God's wishes. But it is also an attribute of God and of God's judgment of people, which is often harsh, but always thought to be just. 
The linkage of righteousness and judgmentalism is captured in some modern definitions of righteous, such as arising from an outraged sense of justice, morality, or fair play. The link also appears in the term self-righteous, which means convinced of one's own righteousness, especially in contrast with the actions and beliefs of others, narrowly moralistic and intolerant. I want to show you that an obsession with righteousness, leading inevitably to self-righteousness, is the normal human condition. It is a feature of our evolutionary design, not a bug or error that crept into minds that would otherwise be objective and rational. Our righteous minds made it possible for human beings, but no other animals, to produce large cooperative groups, tribes, and nations without the glue of kinship. But at the same time, our righteous minds guarantee that our cooperative groups will always be cursed by moralistic strife. Some degree of conflict among groups may even be necessary for the health and development of any society. When I was a teenager, I wished for world peace. But now, I yearn for a world in which competing ideologies are kept in balance, systems of accountability keep us all from getting away with too much, and fewer people believe that righteous ends justify violent means. Not a very romantic wish, but one that we might actually achieve. What lies ahead? This book has three parts, which you can think of as three separate books, except that each one depends on the one before it. Each part presents one major principle of moral psychology. Part one is about the first principle. Intuitions come first, strategic reasoning second. Moral intuitions arise automatically and almost instantaneously, long before moral reasoning has had a chance to get started. And those first intuitions tend to drive our later reasoning. If you think that moral reasoning is something we do to figure out the truth, you'll be constantly frustrated by how foolish, biased, and illogical people become when they disagree with you. But if you think about moral reasoning as a skill that we humans evolved to further our social agendas, to justify our own actions, and to defend the teams we belong to, then things will make a lot more sense. Keep your eye on the intuitions, and don't take people's moral arguments at face value. They're mostly post hoc constructions made up on the fly, crafted to advance one or more strategic objectives. The central metaphor of these four chapters is that the mind is divided like a rider on an elephant, and the rider's job is to serve the elephant. The rider is our conscious reasoning, the stream of words and images of which we are fully aware. The elephant is the other 99% of mental processes, the ones that occur outside of awareness, but that actually govern most of our behavior. I developed this metaphor in my last book, The Happiness Hypothesis, where I described how the rider and elephant work together, sometimes poorly, as we stumble through life in search of meaning and connection. In this book, I'll use the metaphor to solve puzzles, such as why it seems like everyone else is a hypocrite, and why political partisans are so willing to believe outrageous lies and conspiracy theories. I'll also use the metaphor to show you how you can better persuade people who seem unresponsive to reason. Part two is about the second principle of moral psychology, which is that there's more to morality than harm and fairness. The central metaphor of these four chapters is that the righteous mind is like a tongue with six taste receptors. Secular Western moralities are like cuisines that try to activate just one or two of these receptors, either concerns about harm and suffering or concerns about fairness and injustice. But people have so many other powerful moral intuitions, such as those related to liberty, loyalty, authority, and sanctity. I'll explain where these six taste receptors come from, how they form the basis of the world's many moral cuisines, and why politicians on the right have a built-in advantage when it comes to cooking meals that voters like. Part three is about the third principle, morality binds and blinds. The central metaphor of these four chapters is that human beings are 90% chimp and 10% bee. Human nature was produced by natural selection working at two levels simultaneously. Individuals compete with individuals within every group, and we are the descendants of primates who excelled in that competition. This gives us the ugly side of our nature, the one that is usually featured in books about our evolutionary origins. We are indeed selfish hypocrites, so skilled at putting on a show of virtue that we fool even ourselves. But human nature was also shaped as groups competed with other groups. As Darwin said long ago, 
the most cohesive and cooperative groups generally beat the groups of selfish individuals. Darwin's ideas about group selection fell out of favor in the 1960s, but recent discoveries are putting these ideas back into play, and the implications are profound. We're not always selfish hypocrites. We also have the ability, under special circumstances, to shut down our petty selves and become like cells in a larger body, or like bees in a hive, working for the good of the group. These experiences are often among the most cherished of our lives, although our hivishness can blind us to other moral concerns. Our bee-like nature facilitates altruism, heroism, war, and genocide. Once you see our righteous minds as primate minds with a hivish overlay, you get a whole new perspective on morality, politics, and religion. I'll show that our higher nature allows us to be profoundly altruistic, but that altruism is mostly aimed at members of our own groups. I'll show that religion is, probably, an evolutionary adaptation for binding groups together and helping them to create communities with a shared morality. It is not a virus or parasite, as some scientists, the new atheists, have argued in recent years. And I'll use this perspective to explain why some people are conservative, others are liberal or progressive, and still others become libertarian. People bind themselves into political teams that share a moral narrative. Once they accept a particular narrative, they become blind to alternative moral worlds. A note on terminology. In the United States, the word liberal refers to progressive or left-wing politics, and I will use the word in this sense. But in Europe and elsewhere, the word liberal is truer to its original meaning, that is, valuing liberty above all else, including in economic activities. When Europeans use the word liberal, they often mean something more like the American term libertarian, which cannot be placed easily on the left-right spectrum. Readers from outside the United States may want to swap in the words progressive or left-wing whenever I say liberal. In the coming chapters, I'll draw on the latest research in neuroscience, genetics, social psychology, and evolutionary modeling. But the take-home message of the book is ancient. It is the realization that we are all self-righteous hypocrites. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Matthew 7. Enlightenment, or wisdom if you prefer, requires us all to take the logs out of our own eyes and then escape from our ceaseless, petty, and divisive moralism. As the 8th century Chinese Zen master Sen San wrote, the perfect way is only difficult for those who pick and choose. Do not like, do not dislike. All will then be clear. Make a hairbreadth difference and heaven and earth are set apart. If you want the truth to stand clear before you, never be for or against. The struggle between for and against is the mind's worst disease. I'm not saying that we should live our lives like Sen San. In fact, I believe that a world without moralism, gossip, and judgment would quickly decay into chaos. But if we want to understand ourselves, our divisions, our limits, and our potential, we need to step back, drop the moralism, apply some moral psychology, and analyze the game we're all playing. Let us now examine the psychology of this struggle between for and against. It is a struggle that plays out in each of our righteous minds and among all of our righteous groups. Part 1, Intuitions Come First, Strategic Reasoning Second. The central metaphor of this part is that the mind is divided like a rider on an elephant, and the rider's job is to serve the elephant. Chapter 1, Where Does Morality Come From? I'm going to tell you a brief story. Pause after you hear it and decide whether the people in the story did anything morally wrong. A family's dog was killed by a car in front of their house. They had heard that dog meat was delicious, so they cut up the dog's body and cooked it and ate it for dinner. Nobody saw them do this. If you were like most of the well-educated people in my studies, you felt an initial flash of disgust, but you hesitated before saying the family had done anything morally wrong. After all, the dog was dead already, so they didn't hurt it, right? And it was their dog, so they had a right to do what they wanted with the carcass, no? If I pushed you to make a judgment, odds are you'd give me a nuanced answer. Something like, well, 
I think it's disgusting, and I think they should have just buried the dog, but I wouldn't say it was morally wrong. Okay, here's a more challenging story. A man goes to the supermarket once a week and buys a chicken. But before cooking the chicken, he has sexual intercourse with it. Then he cooks it and eats it. Once again, no harm, nobody else knows, and like the dog-eating family, it involves a kind of recycling that is, as some of my research subjects pointed out, an efficient use of natural resources. But now the disgust is so much stronger, and the action just seems so degrading. Does that make it wrong? If you're an educated and politically liberal Westerner, you'll probably give another nuanced answer, one that acknowledges the man's right to do what he wants, as long as he doesn't hurt anyone. But if you are not a liberal or libertarian Westerner, you probably think it's wrong, morally wrong, for someone to have sex with a chicken carcass and then eat it. For you, as for most people on the planet, morality is broad. Some actions are wrong, even though they don't hurt anyone. Understanding the simple fact that morality differs around the world and even within societies is the first step toward understanding your righteous mind. The next step is to understand where these many moralities came from in the first place. The Origin of Morality, Take One. I studied philosophy in college, hoping to figure out the meaning of life. After watching too many Woody Allen movies, I had the mistaken impression that philosophy would be of some help. But I had taken some psychology courses too, and, and I loved them, so I chose to continue. In 1987, I was admitted to the graduate program in psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. I had a vague plan to conduct experiments on the psychology of humor. I thought it might be fun to do research that let me hang out in comedy clubs. A week after arriving in Philadelphia, I sat down to talk with Jonathan Barron, a professor who studies how people think and make decisions. With my minimal background in philosophy, we had a good discussion about ethics. Barron asked me point blank, is moral thinking any different from other kinds of thinking? I said that thinking about moral issues, such as whether abortion is wrong, seemed different from thinking about other kinds of questions, such as where to go to dinner tonight, because of the much greater need to provide reasons justifying your moral judgments to other people. Barron responded enthusiastically, and we talked about some ways one might compare moral thinking to other kinds of thinking in the lab. The next day, on the basis of little more than a feeling of encouragement, I asked him to be my advisor, and I set off to study moral psychology. In 1987, moral psychology was a part of developmental psychology. Researchers focused on questions such as how children develop in their thinking about rules, especially rules of fairness. The big question behind this research was, how do children come to know right from wrong? Where does morality come from? There are two obvious answers to this question, nature or nurture. If you pick nature, then you're a nativist. You believe that moral knowledge is native in our mind. It comes preloaded, perhaps in our God-inscribed hearts, as the Bible says, or in our evolved moral emotions, as Darwin argued. But if you believe that moral knowledge comes from nurture, then you are an empiricist. You believe that children are more or less blank slates at birth, as John Locke said. If morality varies around the world and across the centuries, then how could it be innate? Whatever morals we have as adults must have been learned during childhood from our own experience, which includes adults telling us what's right and wrong. Empirical means from observation or experience. But this is a false choice, and in 1987, moral psychology was mostly focused on a third answer, rationalism, which says that kids figure out morality for themselves. Jean Piaget, the greatest developmental psychologist of all time, began his career as a zoologist studying mollusks and insects in his native Switzerland. He was fascinated by the stages that animals went through as they transformed themselves from, say, caterpillars to butterflies. Later, when his attention turned to children, he brought with him this interest in stages of development. Piaget wanted to know how the extraordinary sophistication of adult thinking, a cognitive butterfly, emerges from the limited abilities of young children, lowly caterpillars. Piaget focused on the kinds of errors kids make. For example, he'd put water into two identical drinking glasses and ask kids to tell him if the glasses held the same amount of water. Then, he'd pour the contents of one of the glasses into a tall, skinny glass and ask the child to compare the new glass to the one that had not been touched. 
Kids younger than six or seven usually say that the tall, skinny glass now holds more water because the level is higher. They don't understand that the total volume of water is conserved when it moves from glass to glass. He also found that it's pointless for adults to explain the conservation of volume to kids. The kids won't get it until they reach an age and cognitive stage when their minds are ready for it. And when they are ready, they'll figure it out for themselves just by playing with cups of water. In other words, the understanding of the conservation of volume wasn't innate and it wasn't learned from adults. Kids figure it out for themselves, but only when their minds are ready and they are given the right kinds of experiences. Piaget applied this cognitive developmental approach to the study of children's moral thinking as well. He got down on his hands and knees to play marbles with children, and sometimes he deliberately broke the rules and played dumb. The children then responded to his mistakes, and in so doing, they revealed their growing ability to respect rules, change rules, take turns, and resolve disputes. This growing knowledge came in orderly stages as children's cognitive abilities matured. Piaget argued that children's understanding of morality is like their understanding of those water glasses. We can't say that it is innate, and we can't say that kids learn it directly from adults. It is, rather, self-constructed as kids play with other kids. Taking turns in a game is like pouring water back and forth between glasses. No matter how often you do it with three-year-olds, they're just not ready to get the concept of fairness any more than they can understand the conservation of volume. But once they've reached the age of five or six, then playing games, having arguments, and working things out together will help them learn about fairness far more effectively than any sermon from adults. This is the essence of psychological rationalism. We grow into our rationality as caterpillars grow into butterflies. If the caterpillar eats enough leaves, it will eventually grow wings. And if the child gets enough experiences of turn-taking, sharing, and playground justice, it will eventually become a moral creature, able to use its rational capacities to solve ever harder problems. Rationality is our nature, and good moral reasoning is the end point of development. Rationalism has a long and complex history in philosophy. In this book, I'll use the word rationalist to describe anyone who believes that reasoning is the most important and reliable way to obtain moral knowledge. Piaget's insights were extended by Lawrence Kohlberg, who revolutionized the study of morality in the 1960s with two key innovations. First, he developed a way to quantify Piaget's observation that children's moral reasoning changed over time. He created a set of moral dilemmas that he presented to children of various ages, and he recorded and coded their responses. For example, should a man named Heinz break into a drugstore to steal a drug that would save his dying wife? Should a girl named Louise reveal to her mother that her younger sister had lied to the mother? It didn't much matter whether the child said yes or no. What mattered were the reasons children gave when they tried to explain their answers. Kohlberg found a six-stage progression in children's reasoning about the social world, and this progression matched up well with the stages Piaget had found in children's reasoning about the physical world. Young children judged right and wrong by very superficial features, such as whether a person was punished for an action. If an adult punished the act, then the act must have been wrong. Kohlberg called the first two stages the pre-conventional level of moral judgment, and they correspond to the Piagetian stage at which kids judge the physical world by superficial features. If a glass is taller, then it has more water in it. But during elementary school, most children move on to the two conventional stages, becoming adept at understanding and even manipulating rules and social conventions. This is the age of petty legalism that most of us who grew up with siblings remember well. I'm not hitting you. I'm using your hand to hit you. Stop hitting yourself. Kids at this stage generally care a lot about conformity, and they have great respect for authority, in word, if not always in deed. They rarely question the legitimacy of authority, even as they learn to maneuver within and around the constraints that adults impose on them. After puberty, right when Piaget said that children become capable of abstract thought, Kohlberg found that some children begin to think for themselves about the nature of authority, the meaning of justice, and the reasons behind rules and laws. In the two post-conventional stages, adolescents still value honesty and respect rules and laws, but now they sometimes justify dishonesty or law-breaking in pursuit of still higher goods, particularly justice.
Goldberg painted an inspiring rationalist image of children as moral philosophers trying to work out coherent ethical systems for themselves. In the post-conventional stages, they finally get good at it. Kohlberg's dilemmas were a tool for measuring these dramatic advances in moral reasoning. The liberal consensus. Mark Twain once said that to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Once Kohlberg developed his moral dilemmas and his scoring techniques, the psychological community had a new hammer and a thousand graduate students used it to pound out dissertations on moral reasoning. But there's a deeper reason so many young psychologists began to study morality from a rationalist perspective. And this was Kohlberg's second great innovation. He used his research to build a scientific justification for a secular, liberal, moral order. Kohlberg's most influential finding was that the most morally advanced kids, according to his scoring techniques, were those who had frequent opportunities for role taking, for putting themselves into another person's shoes and looking at a problem from that person's perspective. Egalitarian relationships, such as with peers, invite role-taking, but hierarchical relationships, such as with teachers and parents, do not. It's really hard for a child to see things from the teacher's point of view because the child has never been a teacher. Piaget and Kohlberg both thought that parents and other authorities were obstacles to moral development. If you want your kids to learn about the physical world, let them play with cups and water. Don't lecture them about the conservation of volume. And if you want your kids to learn about the social world, let them play with other kids and resolve disputes. Don't lecture them about the Ten Commandments. And for heaven's sake, don't force them to obey God or their teachers or you. That will only freeze them at the conventional level. Kohlberg's timing was perfect. Just as the first wave of baby boomers was entering graduate school, he transformed moral psychology into a boomer-friendly ode to justice. And he gave them a tool to measure children's progress toward the liberal ideal. For the next 25 years, from the 1970s through the 1990s, moral psychologists mostly just interviewed young people about moral dilemmas and analyzed their justifications. Most of this work was not politically motivated. It was careful and honest scientific research. But by using a framework that predefined morality as justice while denigrating authority, hierarchy, and tradition, it was inevitable that the research would support worldviews that were secular, questioning, and egalitarian. An easier test. If you force kids to explain complex notions, such as how to balance competing concerns about rights and justice, you're guaranteed to find age trends because kids get so much more articulate with each passing year. But if you are searching for the first appearance of a moral concept, then you'd better find a technique that doesn't require much verbal skill. Kohlberg's former student, Elliot Turiel, developed such a technique. His innovation, was to tell children short stories about other kids who break rules and then give them a series of simple yes or no probe questions. For example, you tell a story about a child who goes to school wearing regular clothes even though his school requires students to wear a uniform. You start by getting an overall judgment. Is that okay what the boy did? Most kids say no. You ask if there's a rule about what to wear. Then you probe to find out what kind of rule it is. What if the teacher said it was okay for the boy to wear his regular clothes? Then would it be okay? And what if this happened in another school where they don't have any rules about uniforms? Then would it be okay? Turiel discovered that children as young as five usually say that the boy was wrong to break the rule, but that it would be okay if the teacher gave permission or if it happened in another school where there was no such rule. Children recognize that rules about clothing, food, and many other aspects of social life are social conventions, which are arbitrary and changeable to some extent. But if you ask kids about actions that hurt other people, such as a girl who pushes a boy off a swing because she wants to use it, you get a very different set of responses. Nearly all kids say that the girl was wrong and that she'd be wrong even if the teacher said it was okay, and even if this happened in another school where there were no rules about pushing kids off swings. Children recognize that rules that prevent harm are moral rules, which Turiel defined as rules related to justice, rights, and welfare pertaining to how people ought to relate to each other. In other words, young children don't treat all rules the same as Piaget and Kohlberg had supposed. Kids can't talk like moral philosophers, but they're busy sorting social information in a sophisticated way. They seem to grasp early on that rules that prevent harm are special, important, unalterable, and universal. And this realization, Turiel said, was the foundation of all moral development. 
children construct their moral understanding on the bedrock of the absolute moral truth that harm is wrong. Specific rules may vary across cultures, but in all of the cultures Turiel examined, children still made a distinction between moral rules and conventional rules. Turiel's account of moral development differed many ways from Colbert's, but the political implications were similar. Morality is about treating individuals well. It's about harm and fairness, not loyalty, respect, duty, piety, patriotism, or tradition. Hierarchy and authority are generally bad things, so it's best to let kids figure things out for themselves. Schools and families should therefore embody progressive principles of equality and autonomy, not authoritarian principles that enable elders to train and constrain children. Meanwhile, in the rest of the world, Holberg and Turiel had pretty much defined the field of moral psychology by the time I sat in John Barron's office and decided to study morality. The field I entered was vibrant and growing, yet something about it felt wrong to me. It wasn't the politics. I was very liberal back then, 24 years old and full of indignation at Ronald Reagan and conservative groups such as the righteously named Moral Majority. No, the problem was that the things I was reading were so dry. I had grown up with two sisters, close in age to me. We fought every day, using every dirty rhetorical trick we could think of. Morality was such a passionate affair in my family, yet the articles I was reading were all about reasoning and cognitive structures and domains of knowledge. It just seemed too cerebral. There was hardly any mention of emotions. As a first-year graduate student, I didn't have the confidence to trust my instincts, so I forced myself to continue reading. But then, in my second year, I took a course on cultural psychology and was captivated. The course was taught by a brilliant anthropologist, Alan Fiske, who had spent many years in West Africa studying the psychological foundations of social relationships. Fiske asked us all to read several ethnographies, book-length reports of an anthropologist's fieldwork, each of which focused on a different topic, such as kinship, sexuality, or music. But no matter the topic, morality turned out to be a central theme. I read a book on witchcraft among the Azande of Sudan. It turns out that witchcraft beliefs arise in surprisingly similar forms in many parts of the world, which suggests either that there really are witches, or, more likely, that there's something about the human mind that often generates this cultural institution. The Azande believed that witches were just as likely to be men as women, and the fear of being called a witch made the Azande careful not to make their neighbors angry or envious. That was my first hint that groups create supernatural beings not to explain the universe, but to order their societies. I read a book about the Alangat, a tribe in the Philippines whose young men gained honor by cutting off people's heads. Some of these beheadings were revenge killings, which offered Western readers a motive they could understand. But many of these murders were committed against strangers who were not involved in any kind of feud with the killer. The author explained these most puzzling killings as ways that small groups of men channeled resentments and frictions within the group into a group-strengthening hunting party, capped off by a long night of communal celebratory singing. This was my first hint that morality often involves tension within the group linked to competition between different groups. These ethnographies were fascinating, often beautifully written, and intuitively graspable despite the strangeness of their content. Reading each book was like spending a week in a new country. Confusing at first, but gradually you tune up, finding yourself better able to guess what's going to happen next. And, as with all foreign travel, you learn as much about where you're from as where you're visiting. I began to see the United States and Western Europe as extraordinary historical exceptions, new societies that had found a way to strip down and thin out the thick, all-encompassing moral orders that the anthropologists wrote about. Nowhere was this thinning more apparent than in our lack of rules about what the anthropologists call purity and pollution. Contrast us with the Hua of New Guinea, who have developed elaborate networks of food taboos that govern what men and women may eat. In order for their boys to become men, they have to avoid foods that in any way resemble vaginas, including anything that is red, wet, slimy, comes from a hole, or has hair. It sounds at first like arbitrary superstition mixed with the predictable sexism of a patriarchal society. Turiel would call these rules social conventions because the Hua don't believe that men in other tribes have to follow these rules. 
But the Hua certainly seemed to think of their food rules as moral rules. They talked about them constantly, judged each other by their food habits, and governed their lives, duties, and relationships by what the anthropologist Anna Meigs called a religion of the body. But it's not just hunter-gatherers in rainforests who believe that bodily practices can be moral practices. When I read the Hebrew Bible, I was shocked to discover how much of the book, one of the sources of Western morality, was taken up with rules about food, menstruation, sex, skin, and the handling of corpses. Some of these rules were clear attempts to avoid disease, such as the long sections of Leviticus on leprosy. But many of the rules seemed to follow a more emotional logic about avoiding disgust. For example, the Bible prohibits Jews from eating or even touching the swarming things that swarm upon the earth. And just think how much more disgusting a swarm of mice is than a single mouse. Other rules seem to follow a conceptual logic involving keeping categories pure or not mixing things together, such as clothing made from two different fibers. So what's going on here? If Turiel was right that morality is really about harm, then why do most non-Western cultures moralize so many practices that seem to have nothing to do with harm? Why do many Christians and Jews believe that cleanliness is next to godliness? And why do so many Westerners, even secular ones, continue to see choices about food and sex as being heavily loaded with moral significance. Liberals sometimes say that religious conservatives are sexual prudes for whom anything other than missionary position intercourse within marriage is a sin. But conservatives can just as well make fun of liberal struggles to choose a balanced breakfast, balanced among moral concerns about free-range eggs, fair trade coffee, naturalness, and a variety of toxins, some of which such as genetically modified corn and soybeans, pose a greater threat spiritually than biologically. Even if Turiel was right that children lock onto harmfulness as a method for identifying immoral actions, I couldn't see how kids in the West, let alone among the Azande, the Alangut, and the Hua, could have come to all this purity and pollution stuff on their own. There must be more to moral development than kids constructing rules as they take the perspectives of other people and feel their pain there must be something beyond rationalism. The Great Debate. When anthropologists wrote about morality, it was as though they spoke a different language from the psychologists I had been reading. The Rosetta Stone that helped me translate between the two fields was a paper that had just been published by Fisk's former advisor, Richard Schwader, at the University of Chicago. Schwader is a psychological anthropologist who had lived and worked in Orissa a state on the east coast of India. He had found large differences in how Oriyans, residents of Orissa, and Americans thought about personality and individuality, and these differences led to corresponding differences in how they thought about morality. Schwader quoted the anthropologist Clifford Geertz on how unusual Westerners are in thinking about people as discrete individuals. The Western conception of the person as a bounded, unique, more or less integrated motivational and cognitive universe, a dynamic center of awareness, emotion, judgment, and action, organized into a distinctive whole and set contrastively both against other such wholes and against its social and natural background is, however incorrigible it may seem to us, a rather peculiar idea within the context of the world's cultures. Schwader offered a simple idea to explain why the self differs so much across cultures. All societies must resolve a small set of questions about how to order society, the most important being how to balance the needs of individuals and groups. There seem to be just two primary ways of answering this question. Most societies have chosen the sociocentric answer, placing the needs of groups and institutions first, and subordinating the needs of individuals. In contrast, the individualistic answer places individuals at the center and makes society a servant of the individual. The sociocentric answer dominated most of the ancient world, but the individualistic answer became a powerful rival during the Enlightenment. The individualistic answer largely vanquished the sociocentric approach in the 20th century as individual rights expanded rapidly, consumer culture spread, and the Western world reacted with horror to the evils perpetrated by the ultra-sociocentric fascist and communist empire. European nations with strong social safety nets are not sociocentric on this definition. They just do a very good job of protecting individuals from the vicissitudes of life. Schwader thought that the theories of Kohlberg and Turiel were produced by and for people from individualistic cultures. 
He doubted that those theories would apply in ERISA, where morality was sociocentric, selves were interdependent, and no bright line separated moral rules preventing harm from social conventions regulating behavior not linked directly to harm. To test his ideas, he and two collaborators came up with 39 very short stories in which someone does something that would violate a rule either in the United States or in ERISA. The researchers then interviewed 180 children, ranging in age from 5 to 13, and 60 adults who lived in Hyde Park, the neighborhood surrounding the University of Chicago, about these stories. They also interviewed a matched sample of Brahmin children and adults in the town of Bhubaneswar, an ancient pilgrimage site in Orissa, and 120 people from low, untouchable town. Altogether, it was an enormous undertaking, 600 long interviews in two very different cities. The interview used Turiel's method, more or less, but the scenarios covered many more behaviors than Turiel had ever asked about. As you can see in the top third of figure 1.1, people in some of the stories obviously hurt other people or treated them unfairly. The top third of figure 1 lists two actions that Indians and Americans agreed were wrong. The first one is, while walking, a man saw a dog sleeping on the road. He walked up to it and kicked it. The second one is, a father said to his son, if you do well on the exam, I will buy you a pen. The son did well on the exam, but the father did not give him anything. Subjects, the people being interviewed, in both countries condemned these actions by saying that they were wrong, unalterably wrong, and universally wrong. But the Indians would not condemn other cases that seemed, to Americans, just as clearly to involve harm and unfairness. Examples of these actions are shown in the middle third of figure 1.1. The first one is, a young married woman went alone to see a movie without informing her husband. When she returned home, her husband said, if you do it again, I will beat you black and blue. She did it again, he beat her black and blue. How would you judge the husband? The second one is, a man had a married son and a married daughter. After his death, his son claimed most of the property. His daughter got little. How would you judge the son? Most of the 39 stories portrayed no harm or unfairness, at least none that could have been obvious to a five-year-old child. And nearly all Americans said that these actions were permissible. Examples of these actions are shown in the bottom third of figure 1.1. The first one is, in a family, a 25-year-old son addresses his father by his first name. The second one is, a woman cooked rice and wanted to eat with her husband and his elder brother. Then she ate with them. How would you judge the woman? The third one is, a widow in your community eats fish two or three times a week. The fourth one is, after defecation, a woman did not change her clothes before cooking. If Indians said that these actions were wrong, then Turiel would predict that they were condemning the actions merely as violations of social convention. Yet most of the Indian subjects, even the five-year-old children, said that these actions were wrong, universally wrong, and unalterably wrong. Indian practices related to food, sex, clothing, and gender relations were almost always judged to be moral issues, not social conventions. And there were few differences between the adults and children within each city. In other words, Schwader found almost no trace of social conventional thinking in the sociocentric culture of Orissa, where, as he put it, the social order is a moral order. Morality was much broader and thicker in Orissa. Almost any practice could be loaded up with moral force. And if that were true, then Turiel's theory became less plausible. Children were not figuring out morality for themselves based on the bedrock certainty that harm is bad. Even in Chicago, Schwader found relatively little evidence of social conventional thinking. There were plenty of stories that contained no obvious harm or injustice, such as a widow eating fish, and Americans predictably said that those cases were fine. But more important, they didn't see these behaviors as social conventions that could be changed by popular consent. They believed that widows should be able to eat whatever they darn well please, and if there's some other country where people try to limit widows' freedoms, well, they're wrong to do so. Even in the United States, the social order is a moral order, but it's an individualistic order built up around the protection of individuals and their freedoms. The distinction between morals and mere conventions 
is not a tool that children everywhere use to self-construct their moral knowledge. Rather, the distinction turns out to be a cultural artifact, a necessary byproduct of the individualistic answer to the question of how individuals and groups relate. When you put individuals first before society, then any rule or social practice that limits personal freedom can be questioned. If it doesn't protect somebody from harm, then it can't be morally justified. It's just a social convention. Schwader's study was a major attack on the whole rationalist approach, and Turiel didn't take it lying down. He wrote a long rebuttal essay, pointing out that many of Schwader's 39 stories were trick questions. They had very different meanings in India and America. For example, Hindus in Orissa believe that fish is a hot food that will stimulate a person's sexual appetite. If a widow eats hot foods, she's more likely to have sex with someone, which would offend the spirit of her dead husband and prevent her from reincarnating at a higher level. Turiel argued that once you take into account Indian informational assumptions about the way the world works, you see that most of Schwader's 39 stories really were moral violations, harming victims in ways that Americans could not see. So Schwader's study didn't contradict Turiel's claims. It might even support them if we could find out for sure whether Schwader's Indian subjects saw harm in the stories. Disgust and Disrespect When I read the Schwader and Turiel essays, I had two strong reactions. The first was an intellectual agreement with Turiel's defense. Schwader had used trick questions not to be devious, but to demonstrate that rules about food, clothing, ways of addressing people, and other seemingly conventional matters could all get woven into a thick moral web. Nonetheless, I agreed with Turiel that Schwader's study was missing an important experimental control. He didn't ask his subjects about harm. If Schwader wanted to show that morality extended beyond harm in Orissa, he had to show that people were willing to morally condemn actions that they themselves stated were harmless. My second reaction was a gut feeling that Schwader was ultimately right. His explanation of sociocentric morality fits so perfectly with the ethnographies I had read in Fisk's class. His emphasis on the moral emotions was so satisfying after reading all that cerebral, cognitive, developmental work. I thought that if somebody ran the right study, one that controlled for perceptions of harm, Schwader's claims about cultural differences would survive the test. I spent the next semester figuring out how to become that somebody. I started writing very short stories about people who do offensive things, but do them in such a way that nobody is harmed. I called these stories harmless taboo violations, and you read two of them at the start of this chapter, about dog eating and chicken eating. I made up dozens of these stories, but quickly found that the ones that worked best fell into two categories, disgust and disrespect. If you want to give people a quick flash of revulsion, but deprive them of any victim they can use to justify moral condemnation, Ask them about people who do disgusting or disrespectful things, but make sure the actions are done in private so that nobody else is offended. For example, one of my disrespect stories was, a woman is cleaning out her closet and she finds her old American flag. She doesn't want the flag anymore, so she cuts it up into pieces and uses the rags to clean her bathroom. My idea was to give adults and children stories that pitted gut feelings about important cultural norms against reasoning about harmlessness and then see which force was stronger. Turiel's rationalism predicted that reasoning about harm is the basis of moral judgment, so even though people might say it's wrong to eat your dog, they would have to treat the act as a violation of a social convention. We don't eat our dogs, but hey, if people in another country want to eat their ex-pets rather than bury them, who are we to criticize? Schwader's theory, on the other hand, said that Turiel's predictions should hold among members of individualistic secular societies, but not elsewhere. I now had a study design. I just had to find the elsewhere. I spoke Spanish fairly well, so when I learned that a major conference of Latin American psychologists was to be held in Buenos Aires in July 1989, I bought a plane ticket. I had no contacts and no idea how to start international research collaboration, so I just went to every talk that had anything to do with morality. I was chagrined to discover that psychology in Latin America was not very scientific. It was heavily theoretical, and much of that theory was Marxist, focused on oppression, colonialism, and power. I was beginning to despair when I chanced upon a session run by some Brazilian psychologists who were using Kohlbergian methods to study moral development. I spoke afterward to the chair of the session, Angela Biagio, and her graduate student, Sylvia Kohler. Even though they both liked Kohlberg's approach, 
They were interested in hearing about alternatives. Biagio invited me to visit them after the conference at their university in Porto Alegre, the capital of the southernmost state in Brazil. Southern Brazil is the most European part of the country, settled largely by Portuguese, German, and Italian immigrants in the 19th century. With its modern architecture and middle-class prosperity, Porto Alegre didn't look anything like the Latin America of my imagination, so at first I was disappointed. I wanted my cross-cultural study to involve someplace exotic, like Arissa. But Sylvia Kohler was a wonderful collaborator, and she had two great ideas about how to increase our cultural diversity. First, she suggested we run the study across social class. The divide between rich and poor is so vast in Brazil that it's as though people live in different countries. We decided to interview adults and children from the educated middle class and also from the lower class, adults who worked as servants for wealthy people and who rarely had more than an eighth grade education, and also children from a public school in the neighborhood where many of the servants lived. Second, Sylvia had a friend who had just been hired as a professor in Recife, a city in the northeastern tip of the country, a region that is culturally very different from Porto Alegre. Sylvia arranged for me to visit her friend, Graça Dias, the following month. Sylvia and I worked for two weeks with a team of undergraduate students, translating the harmless taboo stories into Portuguese, selecting the best ones, refining the probe questions, and testing our interview script to make sure that everything was understandable, even by the least educated subjects, some of whom were illiterate. Then I went off to Recife, where Graça and I trained a team of students to conduct interviews in exactly the way they were being done in Porto Alegre. In Recife, I finally felt like I was working in an exotic, tropical locale, with Brazilian music wafting through the streets and ripe mangoes falling from the trees. More important, the people of Northeast Brazil are mostly of mixed ancestry, African and European, and the region is poorer and much less industrialized than Porto Alegre. When I returned to Philadelphia, I trained my own team of interviewers and supervised the data collection for the four groups of subjects in Philadelphia. The design of the study was therefore what we called three by two by two, meaning that we had three cities, and in each city we had two levels of social class, high and low. And within each social class, we had two age groups, children ages 10 to 12, and adults ages 18 to 28. That made for 12 groups in all, with 30 people in each group, for a total of 360 interviews. This large number of subjects allowed me to run statistical tests to examine the independent effects of city, social class, and age. I predicted that Philadelphia would be the most individualistic of the three cities, and therefore the most Turiel-like, and Recife would be the most sociocentric, and therefore more like Orissa in its judgments. The results were as clear as could be in support of Schrader. First, all four of my Philadelphia groups confirmed Turiel's findings that Americans make a big distinction between moral and conventional violations. I used two stories taken directly from Turiel's research. A girl pushes a boy off a swing, that's a clear moral violation. And a boy refuses to wear a school uniform, that's a conventional violation. This validated my method. It meant that any differences I found on the harmless taboo stories could not be attributed to some quirk about the way I phrased the probe questions or trained my interviewers. The upper class Brazilians looked just like the Americans on these stories. But the working class Brazilian kids usually thought that it was wrong and universally wrong to break the social convention and not wear the uniform. In Recife in particular, the working class kids judged the uniform rebel in exactly the same way they judged the swing pusher. This pattern supported Schwader. The size of the moral conventional distinction varied across cultural groups. The second thing I found was that people responded to the harmless taboo stories just as Schwader had predicted. The upper class Philadelphians judged them to be violations of social convention, and the lower class Recifeans judged them to be moral violations. There was an effect of city, Porto Alegreans moralized more than Philadelphians, and Recifeans moralized more than Porto Alegreans. There was an effect of social class, lower class groups moralized more than upper class groups. And there was an effect of age, children moralized more than adults. Unexpectedly, the effect of social class was much larger than the effect of city. In other words, well-educated people in all three cities were more similar to each other than they were to their lower class neighbors. I had flown 5,000 miles south to search for moral variation, when in fact, there was more to be found a few blocks west of campus in the poor neighborhoods surrounding my university. My third finding was that all the differences I found held up when I controlled for perceptions of harm. 
I had included a probe question that directly asked after each story, do you think anyone was harmed by what the person in this story did? If Schwader's findings were caused by perceptions of hidden victims, as Turiel proposed, then my cross-cultural differences should have disappeared when I removed the subjects who said yes to this question. But when I filtered out these people, the cultural differences got bigger, not smaller. This was very strong support for Schwader's claim that the moral domain goes far beyond harm. Most of my subjects said that the harmless taboo violations were universally wrong, even though they harmed nobody. In other words, Schwader won the debate. I had replicated Turiel's findings using Turiel's methods on people like me, educated Westerners raised in an individualistic culture, but had confirmed Schwader's claim that Turiel's theory didn't travel well. The moral domain varied across nations and social classes. For most of the people in my study, the moral domain extended well beyond issues of harm and fairness. It was hard to see how a rationalist could explain these results. How could children self-construct their moral knowledge about disgust and disrespect from their private analyses of harmfulness? There must be some other sources of moral knowledge, including cultural learning, as Schwader argued, or innate moral intuitions about disgust and disrespect, as I began to argue years later. Inventing victims. Even though the results came out just as Schwader had predicted, there were a number of surprises along the way. The biggest surprise was that so many subjects tried to invent victims. I had written the stories carefully to remove all conceivable harm to other people, yet in 38% of the 1,620 times that people heard a harmless offensive story, they claimed that somebody was harmed. In the dog story, for example, many people said that the family itself would be harmed because they would get sick from eating dog meat. Was this an example of the informational assumption that Turiel had talked about? Were people really condemning the actions because they foresaw these harms? Or was it the reverse process? Were people inventing these harms because they had already condemned the actions? I conducted many of the Philadelphia interviews myself, and it was obvious that most of these supposed harms were post hoc fabrications. People usually condemned the actions very quickly. They didn't seem to need much time to decide what they thought, but it often took them a while to come up with a victim and they usually offered those victims up half-heartedly and almost apologetically. As one subject said, well, I don't know, maybe the woman will feel guilty afterward about throwing out her flag? Many of these victim claims were downright preposterous, such as the child who justified his condemnation of the flag shredder by saying that the rags might clog up the toilet and cause it to overflow. But something even more interesting happened when I or the other interviewers challenged these invented victim claims. I had trained my interviewers to correct people gently when they made claims that contradicted the text of the story. For example, if someone said, it's wrong to cut up the flag because a neighbor might see her do it and he might be offended, the interviewer replied, well, it says here in the story that nobody saw her do it. So would you still say it was wrong for her to cut up the flag? Yet even when subjects recognized that their victim claims were bogus, they still refused to say that the act was okay. Instead, they kept searching for another victim. They said things like, I know it's wrong, but I just can't think of a reason why. They seemed to be morally dumbfounded, rendered speechless by their inability to explain verbally what they knew intuitively. These subjects were reasoning. They were working quite hard at reasoning, but it was not reasoning in search of truth. It was reasoning in support of their emotional reaction. It was reasoning as described by the philosopher David Hume who wrote in 1739 that reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. I had found evidence for Hume's claim. I had found that moral reasoning was often a servant of moral emotions, and this was a challenge to the rationalist approach that dominated moral psychology. I published these findings in one of the top psychology journals in October 1993 and then waited nervously for the response. I knew that the field of moral psychology was not going to change overnight just because one grad student produced some data that didn't fit into the prevailing paradigm. I knew that debates in moral psychology could be quite heated, though always civil. What I did not expect, however, was that there would be no response at all. Here I thought I had done the definitive study to settle a major debate in moral psychology, yet almost nobody cited my work, not even to attack it, in the first five years after I published it. My dissertation landed with a silent thud 
in part because I published it in a social psychology journal. But in the early 1990s, the field of moral psychology was still a part of developmental psychology. If you called yourself a moral psychologist, it meant that you studied moral reasoning and how it changed with age, and you cited Kohlberg extensively whether you agreed with him or not. But psychology itself was about to change and become a lot more emotional. In sum, where does morality come from? The two most common answers have long been that it is innate, the nativist answer, or that it comes from childhood learning, the empiricist answer. In this chapter, I considered a third possibility, the rationalist answer, which dominated moral psychology when I entered the field, that morality is self-constructed by children on the basis of their experiences with harm. Kids know that harm is wrong because they hate to be harmed, and they gradually come to see that it is therefore wrong to harm others, which leads them to understand fairness and eventually justice. I explained why I came to reject this answer after conducting research in Brazil and the United States. I came to three conclusions. First, the moral domain varies by culture. It is unusually narrow in Western, educated, and individualistic cultures. Sociocentric cultures broaden the moral domain to encompass and regulate more aspects of life. Second, people sometimes have gut feelings, particularly about disgust and disrespect, that can drive their reasoning. Moral reasoning is sometimes a post hoc fabrication. Third, Morality can't be entirely self-constructed by children based on their growing understanding of harm. Cultural learning or guidance must play a larger role than rationalist theories have given us. If morality doesn't come primarily from reasoning, then that leaves some combination of innateness and social learning as the most likely candidate. In the rest of this book, I'll try to explain how morality can be innate as a set of evolved intuitions and learned as children learn to apply those intuitions within a particular culture. We're born to be righteous, but we have to learn what, exactly, people like us should be righteous about. Before we move on to Chapter 2, here's a brief example of moral psychology in action. I once overheard a Kohlberg-style moral judgment interview being conducted in the bathroom of a McDonald's restaurant in northern Indiana. The person interviewed, the subject, was a Caucasian male roughly 30 years old. The interviewer was a Caucasian male approximately 4 years old. The interview began at adjacent urinal. Interviewer. Dad, what would happen if I pooped in here? Pointing to the urinal. Subject. It would be yucky. Go ahead and flush. Come on, let's go wash our hands. The pair then moved over to the sink. Dad, what would happen if I pooped in the sink? Uh, the people who work here would get mad at you. What would happen if I pooped in the sink at home? Uh, I'd get mad at you. What would happen if you pooped in the sink at home? Uh, Mom would get mad at me. Well, what would happen if we all pooped in the sink at home? Uh, I, I guess I guess we'd all get in trouble. <laughs> yeah, we'd all get in trouble. Come, come on, let's go dry our hands. We have to go. Note the skill and persistence of the interviewer, who probes for a deeper answer by changing the transgression to remove the punisher. Yet even when everyone cooperates in the rule violation so that nobody can play the role of punisher, the subject still clings to a notion of cosmic justice in which somehow the whole family would get in trouble. Of course, the father is not really trying to demonstrate his best moral reasoning. Moral reasoning is usually done to influence other people, as I'll show in chapter four. And what the father is trying to do is get his curious son to feel the right emotion, disgust and fear, to motivate appropriate bathroom behavior. Chapter two, the intuitive dog and its rational tail. One of the greatest truths in psychology is that the mind is divided into parts that sometimes conflict. To be human is to feel pulled in different directions and to marvel, sometimes in horror, at your inability to control your own actions. The Roman poet Ovid lived at a time when people thought diseases were caused by imbalances of bile, but he knew enough psychology to have one of his characters lament, I am dragged along by a strange new force. Desire and reason are pulling in different directions. I see the right way and approve it, but follow the wrong. Ancient thinkers gave us many metaphors to understand this conflict, but few are more colorful than the one in Plato's dialogue Timaeus. The narrator, Timaeus, explains how the gods created the universe, including us. Timaeus says that a creator god, who was perfect and created only perfect things, 
was filling his new universe with souls. And what could be more perfect in a soul than perfect rationality? So, after making a large number of perfect rational souls, the Creator God decided to take a break, delegating the last bits of creation to some lesser deities who did their best to design vessels for these souls. The deities began by encasing the souls in that most perfect of shapes, the sphere, which explains why our heads are more or less round. But they quickly realized that these spherical heads would face difficulties and indignities as they rolled around the uneven surface of the earth. So the gods created bodies to carry the heads, and they animated each body with a second soul, vastly inferior because it was neither rational nor immortal. This second soul contained, quote, those dreadful but necessary disturbances, pleasure first of all, evil's most powerful lure, then pains that make us run away from what is good. Besides these, boldness also and fear, foolish counselors both. Then also the spirit of anger hard to assuage, and expectation easily led astray. These they fused with unreasoning sense perception and all venturing lust, and so, as was necessary, they constructed the mortal type of soul. Pleasures, emotions, senses, all were necessary evils. To give the divine head a bit of distance from the seething body and its foolish counsel, the gods invented the neck. Most creation myths situate a tribe or ancestor at the center of creation, so it seems odd to give the honor to a mental faculty, at least until you realize that this philosopher's myth makes philosophers look pretty darn good. It justifies their perpetual employment as the high priests of reason or as dispassionate philosopher kings. It's the ultimate rationalist fantasy the passions are and are only to be the servants of reason, to reverse Hume's formulation. And just in case there was any doubt about Plato's contempt for the passion, Timaeus adds that a man who masters his emotions will live a life of reason and justice and will be reborn into a celestial heaven of eternal happiness. A man who is mastered by his passions, however, will be reincarnated as a woman. Western philosophy has been worshiping reason and distrusting the passions for thousands of years. There's a direct line running from Plato through Immanuel Kant to Lawrence Kohlberg. I'll refer to this worshipful attitude throughout this book as the rationalist delusion. I call it a delusion because when a group of people make something sacred, the members of the cult lose the ability to think clearly about it. Morality binds and blinds. The true believers produce pious fantasies that don't match reality. And at some point, somebody comes along to knock the idol off its pedestal. That was Hume's project, with his philosophically sacrilegious claim that reason was nothing but the servant of the passions. Thomas Jefferson offered a more balanced model of the relationship between reason and emotion. In 1786, while serving as the American minister to France, Jefferson fell in love. Maria Cosway was a beautiful 27-year-old English artist who was introduced to Jefferson by a mutual friend. Jefferson and Cosway then spent the next few hours doing exactly what people should do to fall madly in love. They strolled around Paris on a perfect sunny day, two foreigners sharing each other's aesthetic appreciations of a grand city. Jefferson sent messengers bearing lies to cancel his evening meetings so that he could extend the day into the night. Cosway was married, although the marriage seems to have been an open marriage of convenience, and historians do not know how far the romance progressed in the weeks that followed. But Cosway's husband soon insisted on taking his wife back to England, leaving Jefferson in pain. To ease that pain, Jefferson wrote Cosway a love letter, using a literary trick to cloak the impropriety of writing about love to a married woman. Jefferson wrote the letter as a dialogue between his head and his heart, debating the wisdom of having pursued a friendship, even while he knew it would have to end. Jefferson's head is the platonic ideal of reason, scolding the heart for having dragged them both into yet another fine mess. The heart asks the head for pity, but the head responds with a stern lecture. Quote, Everything in this world is a matter of calculation. Advance then with caution the balance in your hand. Put into one scale the pleasures which any object may offer, but put fairly into the other the pains which are to follow, and see which preponderates. End quote. After taking round after round of abuse rather passively, the heart finally rises to defend itself and to put the head in its proper place, which is to handle problems that don't involve people. Quote, When nature assigned us the same habitation, she gave us over it a divided empire. To you she allotted the field of science, to me that of morals. 
when the circle is to be squared or the orbit of a comet to be traced, when the arch of greatest strength or the solid of least resistance is to be investigated, take up the problem, it is yours. Nature has given me no cognizance of it. In like manner, in denying to you the feelings of sympathy, of benevolence, of gratitude, of justice, of love, of friendship, she has excluded you from their control. To these she has adapted the mechanism of the heart. Morals were too essential to the happiness of man to be risked on the uncertain combinations of the head. She laid their foundation therefore in sentiment, not in science." End quote. So now we have three models of the mind. Plato said that reason ought to be the master, even if philosophers are the only ones who can reach a high level of mastery. Hume said that reason is and ought to be the servant of the passions. And Jefferson gives us a third option, in which reason and sentiment are, and ought to be, independent co-rulers, like the emperors of Rome, who divided the empire into eastern and western halves. Who was right? Wilson's Prophecy Plato, Hume, and Jefferson tried to understand the design of the human mind without the help of the most powerful tool ever devised for understanding the design of living things, Darwin's theory of evolution. Darwin was fascinated by morality because any example of cooperation among living creatures had to be squared with his general emphasis on competition and the survival of the fittest. Darwin offered several explanations for how morality could have evolved, and many of them pointed to emotions such as sympathy, which he thought was the foundation stone of the social instinct. He also wrote about feelings of shame and pride, which were associated with the desire for good reputation. Darwin was a nativist about morality. He thought that natural selection gave us minds that were preloaded with moral emotions. But as the social sciences advanced in the 20th century, their course was altered by two waves of moralism that turned nativism into a moral offense. The first was the horror among anthropologists and others at social Darwinism, the idea, raised but not endorsed by Darwin, that the richest and most successful nations, races, and individuals are the fittest. Therefore, giving charity to the poor interferes with the natural progress of evolution. It allows the poor to breed. The claim that some races were innately superior to others was later championed by Hitler. And so, if Hitler was a nativist, then all nativists were Nazis. That conclusion is illogical, but it makes sense emotionally if you dislike nativism. The second wave of moralism was the radical politics that washed over universities in America, Europe, and Latin America in the 1960s and 1970s. Radical reformers usually want to believe that human nature is a blank slate on which any utopian vision can be sketched. If evolution gave men and women different sets of desires and skills, for example, that would be an obstacle to achieving gender equality in many professions. If nativism could be used to justify existing power structures, then nativism must be wrong. Again, this is a logical error, but this is the way righteous minds work. The cognitive scientist Steven Pinker was a graduate student at Harvard in the 1970s. In his 2002 book, The Blank Slate, The Modern Denial of Human Nature, Pinker describes the ways scientists betrayed the values of science to maintain loyalty to the progressive movement. Scientists became moral exhibitionists in the lecture hall as they demonized fellow scientists and urged their students to evaluate ideas not for their truth, but for their consistency with progressive ideals such as racial and gender equality. Nowhere was the betrayal of science more evident than in the attacks on Edward O. Wilson, a lifelong student of ants and ecosystems. In 1975, Wilson published Sociobiology, The New Synthesis. The book explored how natural selection, which indisputably shaped animal bodies, also shaped animal behavior. That wasn't controversial, but Wilson had the audacity to suggest in his final chapter that natural selection also influenced human behavior. Wilson believed that there is such a thing as human nature and that human nature constrains the range of what we can achieve when raising our children or designing new social institutions. Wilson used ethics to illustrate his point. He was a professor at Harvard along with Lawrence Kohlberg and the philosopher John Rawls, so he was well acquainted with their brand of rationalist theorizing about rights and justice. It seemed clear to Wilson that what the rationalists were really doing was generating clever justifications for moral intuitions that were best explained by evolution. 
Do people believe in human rights because such rights actually exist, like mathematical truths sitting on a cosmic shelf next to the Pythagorean theorem just waiting to be discovered by platonic reasoners? Or do people feel revulsion and sympathy when they read accounts of torture and then invent a story about universal rights to help justify their feelings? Wilson sided with Hume. He charged that what moral philosophers were really doing was fabricating justifications after consulting the emotive centers of their own brains. He predicted that the study of ethics would soon be taken out of the hands of philosophers and biologicized, or made to fit with the emerging science of human nature. Such a linkage of philosophy, biology, and evolution would be an example of the new synthesis that Wilson dreamed of, and that he later referred to as concilium, the jumping together of ideas to create a unified body of knowledge. Prophets challenged the status quo, often earning the hatred of those in power. Wilson therefore deserves to be called a prophet of moral psychology. He was harassed and excoriated in print and in public. He was called a fascist, which justified for some the charge that he was a racist, which justified for some the attempt to stop him from speaking in public. Protesters who tried to disrupt one of his scientific talks rushed the stage and chanted, Racist Wilson, you can't hide. We charge you with genocide. The Emotional 90s. By the time I entered graduate school in 1987, the shooting had stopped and sociobiology had been discredited. At least that's the message I picked up from hearing scientists use the word as a pejorative term for the naive attempt to reduce psychology to evolution. Moral psychology was not about evolved emotion. It was about the development of reasoning and information processing. Yet, when I looked outside of psychology, I found many wonderful books on the emotional basis of morality. I read Franz de Waal's Good Natured, The Origins of Right and Wrong in Humans and Other Animals. De Waal did not claim that chimpanzees had morality. He argued only that chimps and other apes have most of the psychological building blocks that humans use to construct moral systems and communities. These building blocks are largely emotional, such as feelings of sympathy, fear, anger, and affection. I also read Descartes' Error by the neuroscientist Antonio Damasio. Damasio had noticed an unusual pattern of symptoms in patients who had suffered brain damage to a specific part of the brain, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, abbreviated VMPFC. It's the region just behind and above the bridge of the nose. Their emotionality dropped nearly to zero. They could look at the most joyous or gruesome photograph and feel nothing. They retained full knowledge of what was right and wrong, and they showed no deficits in IQ. They even scored well on Kohlberg's test of moral reasoning. Yet when it came to making decisions in their personal lives and at work, they made foolish decisions or no decisions at all. They alienated their families and their employers, and their lives fell apart. Damasio's interpretation was that gut feelings and bodily reactions were necessary to think rationally, and that one job of the VMPFC was to integrate those gut feelings into a person's conscious deliberation. When you weigh the advantages and disadvantages of murdering your parents, you can't even do it because feelings of horror come rushing in through the VMPFC. But Damasio's patients could think about anything with no filtering or coloring from their emotions. With the VMPFC shut down, every option at every moment felt as good as every other. The only way to make a decision was to examine each option weighing the pros and cons using conscious verbal reasoning. If you've ever shopped for an appliance about which you have few feelings, say a washing machine, you know how hard it can be once the number of options exceeds six or seven, which is the capacity of our short-term memory. Just imagine what your life would be like if at every moment, in every social situation, picking the right thing to do or say became like picking the best washing machine among 10 options, minute after minute, day after day you'd make foolish decisions too. Damasio's findings were as anti-platonic as could be. Here were people in whom brain damage had essentially shut down communication between the rational soul and the seething passions of the body, which, unbeknownst to Plato, were not based in the heart and stomach, but in the emotion areas of the brain. No more of those dreadful but necessary disturbances, those foolish counselors leading the rational soul astray. Yet, the result of the separation was not the liberation of reason from the thrall of the passions. It was the shocking revelation that reasoning requires the passions. Jefferson's model fits better. When one co-emperor is knocked out and the other tries to rule the empire by himself, 
he's not up to the task. If Jefferson's model were correct, however, then Damasio's patients would still have fared well in the half of life that was always ruled by the head. Yet, the collapse of decision-making, even in purely analytical and organizational tasks, is pervasive. The head can't even do head stuff without the heart. So Hume's model fit these cases best. When the master, the passion, drops dead, the servant, reasoning, has neither the ability nor the desire to keep the estate running. Everything goes to ruin. Why Atheists Won't Sell Their Souls In 1995, I moved to the University of Virginia, UVA, to begin my first job as a professor. Moral psychology was still devoted to the study of moral reasoning. But if you looked beyond developmental psychology, Wilson's new synthesis was beginning. A few economists, philosophers, and neuroscientists were quietly constructing an alternative approach to morality, one whose foundation was the emotions, and the emotions were assumed to have been shaped by evolution. These synthesizers were assisted by the rebirth of sociobiology in 1992 under a new name, evolutionary psychology. I read Jefferson's letter to Cosway during my first month in Charlottesville as part of my initiation into his cult. Jefferson founded UVA in 1819, and here at Mr. Jefferson's University, we regard him as a deity. But I had already arrived at a Jeffersonian view in which moral emotion and moral reasoning were separate processes. Each process could make moral judgments on its own, and they sometimes fought it out for the right to do so. In my first few years at UVA, I conducted several experiments to test this dual process model by asking people to make judgments under conditions that strengthened or weakened one of the processes. For example, social psychologists often ask people to perform tasks while carrying a heavy cognitive load, such as holding the number 7250475 in mind, or while carrying a light cognitive load, such as remembering just the number 7. If performance suffers while people are carrying the heavy load, then we can conclude that controlled thinking, such as conscious reasoning, is necessary for that particular task. But if people do fine on the task regardless of the load, then we can conclude that automatic processes, such as intuition and emotion, are sufficient for performing that task. My question was simple. Can people make moral judgments just as well when carrying a heavy cognitive load as when carrying a light one? The answer turned out to be yes. I found no difference between conditions, no effect of cognitive load. I tried it again with different stories and got the same outcome. I used a computer program to force some people to answer quickly before they had time to think, and I forced other people to wait 10 seconds before offering their judgment. Surely that manipulation would weaken or strengthen moral reasoning and shift the balance of power, I thought, but it didn't. When I came to UVA, I was certain that a Jeffersonian dual process model was right, but I kept failing in my efforts to prove it. My tenure clock was ticking and I was getting nervous. I had to produce a string of publications in top journals within five years or I'd be turned down for tenure and forced to leave UVA. In the meantime, I started running studies to follow up on the moral dumbfounding I had observed a few years earlier in my dissertation interview. I worked with a talented undergraduate, Scott Murphy. Our plan was to increase the amount of dumbfounding by having Scott play devil's advocate rather than gentle interviewer. When Scott succeeded in stripping away arguments, would people change their judgments? Or would they become morally dumbfounded, clinging to their initial judgments while stammering and grasping for reasons? Scott brought 30 UVA students into the lab, one at a time, for an extended interview. He explained that his job was to challenge their reasoning no matter what they said. He then took them through five scenarios. One was Kohlberg's Heinz dilemma. Should Heinz steal a drug to save his wife's life? We predicted that this story would produce little dumbfounding. It pitted concerns about harm and life against concerns about law and property rights, and the story was well constructed to elicit cool, rational, moral reasoning. Sure enough, Scott couldn't whip up any dumbfounding with the Heinz story. People offered good reasons for their answers, and Scott was not able to get them to abandon principles such as life is more important than property. We also chose two scenarios that played more directly on gut feeling. In the roach juice scenario, Scott opened a small can of apple juice, poured it into a new plastic cup, and asked the subject to take a sip. Everyone did. Then Scott brought out a white plastic box and said, I have here in this container a sterilized cockroach. 
we bought some cockroaches from a laboratory supply company. The roaches were raised in a clean environment, but just to be certain, we sterilized the roaches again in an autoclave, which heats everything so hot that no germs can survive. I'm going to dip this cockroach into the juice like this, using a tea strainer. Now, would you take a sip? In the second scenario, Scott offered subjects $2 if they would sign a piece of paper that said, I blank, hereby sell my soul after my death to Scott Murphy for the sum of $2. There was a line for a signature, and below the line was this note. This form is part of a psychology experiment. It is not a legal or binding contract in any way. Scott also told them they could rip up the paper as soon as they signed it, and they'd still get their $2. Only 23% of subjects were willing to sign the paper without any goading from Scott. We were a bit surprised to find that 37% were willing to take a sip of the roach juice. In these cases, Scott couldn't play devil's advocate. For the majorities who said no, however, Scott asked them to explain their reasons and did his best to challenge those reasons. Scott convinced an extra 10% to sip the juice and an extra 17% to sign the sole selling paper. But most people in both scenarios clung to their initial refusal, even though many of them could not generate good reasons. A few people confessed that they were atheists, didn't believe in souls, and yet still felt uncomfortable about signing. Here, too, there wasn't much dumbfounding. People felt that it was ultimately their own choice whether or not to drink the juice or sign the paper. So most subjects seem comfortable saying, I just don't want to do it, even though I can't give you a reason. The main point of the study was to examine responses to two harmless taboo violations. We wanted to know if the moral judgment of disturbing but harmless events would look more like judgments in the Heinz task, closely linked to reasoning, or like those in the roach juice and soul selling task, where people readily confessed that they were following gut feelings. Here's one story we used. Julie and Mark, who are sister and brother, are traveling together in France. They are both on summer vacation from college. One night, they're staying alone in a cabin near the beach. They decide that it would be interesting and fun if they tried making love. At the very least, it would be a new experience for each of them. Julie is already taking birth control pills, but Mark uses a condom too, just to be safe. They both enjoy it, but they decide not to do it again. They keep that night as a special secret between them, which makes them feel even closer to each other. So what do you think about this? Was it wrong for them to have sex? In the other harmless taboo story, Jennifer works in a hospital pathology lab. She's a vegetarian for moral reasons. She thinks it's wrong to kill animals. But one night, she has to incinerate a fresh human cadaver, and she thinks it's a waste to throw away perfectly edible flesh. So she cuts off a piece of flesh and takes it home. Then she cooks it and eats it. We knew these stories were disgusting, and we expected that they'd trigger immediate moral condemnation. Only 20% of subjects said it was okay for Julie and Mark to have sex, and only 13% said it was okay for Jennifer to eat part of a cadaver. But when Scott asked people to explain their judgments and then challenged those judgments, he found exactly the Humean pattern that we had predicted. In these harmless taboo scenarios, people generated far more reasons and discarded far more reasons than in any of the other scenarios. They seemed to be flailing around, throwing out reason after reason, and rarely changing their minds when Scott proved that their latest reason was not relevant. Here's the transcript of one interview about the incest story. Experimenter. So what do you think about this? Was it wrong for Julie and Mark to have sex? Yeah, I think it's totally wrong to have sex. You know, because I'm pretty religious, and, and I just think incest is wrong anyway. But I don't know. What's wrong with incest, would you say? Um, the whole idea of, well, I've heard, I don't even know if this is true, but in the case, if the girl did get pregnant, the kids become deformed most of the time in cases like that but they used a condom and birth control pills. Oh, okay, yeah, you, you did say that. So, so there's no way they're gonna have a kid. Well, I guess the safest sex is abstinence, but um, uh, um, I, I don't know, I, I just think that's wrong. I don't know, what did, you, what did you ask me? Was it wrong for them to have sex? Yeah, I think it's wrong. And I'm trying to find out why, what you think is wrong with it. Okay, um, well, let's see, let, let me think about this. Um, how old were they? They were college age, around 20 or so. Oh, oh, I don't know, I just, it's not something you're brought up to do, it's just not, well, I mean, I wasn't, I assume most people aren't, uh, I think that you shouldn't, I, I don't, I guess my reason is, um, just that, uh, 
you're not brought up to do it. You, you don't see it. It's not, um, I, I just, I don't think it's accepted. That's pretty much it. You wouldn't say that anything you're not brought up to see is wrong, would you? For example, if you're not brought up to see women working outside the home, would you say that makes it wrong for women to work? Oh, well, oh gosh, this is hard. I really, um, I mean, there's just no way I could change my mind. But I just don't know how to, how to show what I'm feeling and what I feel about it. It's, it's crazy. In this transcript, and in many others, it's obvious that people were making up a moral judgment immediately and emotionally. Reasoning was merely the servant of the passion, and when the servant failed to find any good arguments, the master did not change his mind. We quantified some of the behaviors that seemed most indicative of being morally dumbfounded, and these analyses showed big differences between the way people responded to the harmless taboo scenarios compared to the Heinz dilemma. These results supported Hume, not Jefferson or Plato. People made moral judgments quickly and emotionally. Moral reasoning was mostly a post hoc search for reasons to justify the judgments people had already made. But were these judgments representative of moral judgment in general? I had to write some bizarre stories to give people these flashes of moral intuition that they could not easily explain. That can't be how most of our thinking works, can it? Seeing that versus reasoning why. Two years before Scott and I ran the dumbfounding study, I read an extraordinary book that psychologists rarely mention, Patterns, Thinking, and Cognition, by Howard Margolis, a professor of public policy at the University of Chicago. Margolis was trying to understand why people's beliefs about political issues are often so poorly connected to objective facts, and he hoped that cognitive science could solve the puzzle. Yet Margolis was turned off by the approaches to thinking that were prevalent in the 1980s most of which used the metaphor of the mind as a computer. Margolis thought that a better model for studying higher cognition, such as political thinking, was lower cognition, such as vision, which works largely by rapid, unconscious pattern matching. He began his book with an investigation of perceptual illusions, such as the Muller-Lyer illusion, in which one line continues to look longer than the other, even after you know that the two lines are the same length. He then moved on to logic problems, such as the waste and four card task, in which you are shown four cards on a table. You know that each card comes from a deck in which all cards have a letter on one side and a number on the other. Your task is to choose the smallest number of cards that you must turn over to decide whether this rule is true. If there is a vowel on one side, then there is an even number on the other. Please imagine that there are four cards on the table in front of you. The cards show these letters and numbers. E, K, four, seven. Everyone immediately sees that you have to turn over the E, but many people also say you need to turn over the four. They seem to be doing simple-minded pattern matching. There was a vowel and an even number in the question, so let's turn over the vowel and even number. Many people resist the explanation of the simple logic behind the task. Turning over the four and finding a B on the other side would not invalidate the rule whereas turning over the 7 and finding a U would do it, so you need to turn over the E and the 7. When people are told up front what the answer is and asked to explain why that answer is correct, they can do it. But amazingly, they are just as able to offer an explanation and just as confident in their reasoning whether they are told the right answer, E and 7, or the popular but wrong answer, E and 4. Findings such as these led Wason to conclude that judgment and justification are separate processes. Margolis shared Wason's view, summarizing the state of affairs like this. Quote, Given the judgments, themselves produced by the non-conscious cognitive machinery in the brain, sometimes correctly, sometimes not so, human beings produce rationales they believe account for their judgments. But the rationales on this argument are only ex post rationalizations. End quote. Margolis proposed that there are two very different kinds of cognitive processes at work when we make judgments and solve problems. Seeing that and reasoning why. Seeing that is the pattern matching that brains have been doing for hundreds of millions of years. Even the simplest animals are wired to respond to certain patterns of input, such as light or sugar, with certain behaviors, such as turning away from the light or stopping and eating the sugary food. Animals easily learn new patterns and connect them up to their existing behaviors, which can be reconfigured into new patterns as well, 
as when an animal trainer teaches an elephant a new trick. As brains get larger and more complex, animals begin to show more cognitive sophistication, making choices such as where to forage today or when to fly south, and judgment such as whether a subordinate chimpanzee showed properly deferential behavior. But in all cases, the basic psychology is pattern matching. It's the sort of rapid, automatic, and effortless processing that drives our perceptions in the Muller liar illusion. You can't choose whether or not to see the illusion. You're just seeing that one line is longer than the other. Margolis also called this kind of reasoning intuitive. Reasoning why, in contrast, is the process by which we describe how we think we reached a judgment or how we think another person could reach that judgment. Reasoning why can occur only for creatures that have language and a need to explain themselves to other creatures. Reasoning why is not automatic. It's conscious, it sometimes feels like work, and it's easily disrupted by cognitive load. Kohlberg had convinced moral psychologists to study reasoning why and to neglect seeing that. Margolis' ideas were a perfect fit with everything I had seen in my studies. Rapid, intuitive judgment, that's just wrong. Followed by slow and sometimes tortuous justification. Well, their two methods of birth control might fail and the kids they produce might be deformed. The intuition launched the reasoning. But the intuition did not depend on the success or failure of the reasoning. My harmless taboo stories were like Muller liar illusions. They still felt wrong even after you had measured the amount of harm involved and agreed that the stories were harmless. Margolis' theory worked just as well for the easier dilemmas. In the Heinz scenario, most people intuitively see that Heinz should steal the drug. His wife's life is at stake. But in this case, it's easy to find reasons. Kohlberg had constructed the dilemma to make good reasons available on both sides, so nobody gets dumbfounded. The roach juice and soul-selling dilemmas instantly make people see that they want to refuse, but they don't feel much conversational pressure to offer reasons. Not wanting to drink roach-tainted juice isn't a moral judgment, it's a personal preference. Saying, because I don't want to, is a perfectly acceptable justification for one's subjective preferences. Yet moral judgments are not subjective statements. They are claims that somebody did something wrong. I can't call for the community to punish you simply because I don't like what you're doing. I have to point to something outside of my own preferences, and that pointing is our moral reasoning. We do moral reasoning not to reconstruct the actual reasons why we ourselves came to a judgment. We reason to find the best possible reasons why somebody else ought to join us in our judgment. The Rider and the Elephant It took me years to appreciate fully the implications of Margolis's ideas. Part of the problem was that my thinking was entrenched in a prevalent but useless dichotomy between cognition and emotion. After failing repeatedly to get cognition to act independently of emotion, I began to realize that the dichotomy made no sense. Cognition just refers to information processing, which includes higher cognition, such as conscious reasoning, as well as lower cognition, such as visual perception and memory retrieval. Emotion is a bit harder to define. Emotions were long thought to be dumb and visceral, but beginning in the 1980s, scientists increasingly recognized that emotions were filled with cognition. Emotions occur in steps, the first of which is to appraise something that just happened based on whether it advanced or hindered your goals. These appraisals are a kind of information processing. They are cognition. When an appraisal program detects a particular input pattern, it launches a set of changes in your brain that prepare you to respond appropriately. For example, if you hear someone running up behind you on a dark street, your fear system detects the threat and triggers your sympathetic nervous system, firing up the fight-or-flight response, cranking up your heart rate, and widening your pupils to help you take in more information. Emotions are not dumb. Damasio's patients made terrible decisions because they were deprived of emotional input into their decision-making. Emotions are a kind of information processing. Contrasting emotion with cognition is therefore as pointless as contrasting rain with weather or cars with vehicles. Margolis helped me ditch the emotion-cognition contrast. His work helped me see that moral judgment is a cognitive process, as are all forms of judgment. The crucial distinction is really between two different kinds of cognition, intuition and reasoning. 
Moral emotions are one type of moral intuition, but most moral intuitions are more subtle. They don't rise to the level of emotion. The next time you read a newspaper or drive a car, notice the many tiny flashes of condemnation that flit through your consciousness. Is each such flash an emotion? Or ask yourself whether it is better to save the lives of five strangers or one, assuming all else is equal. Do you need an emotion to tell you to go for the five? Do you need reasoning? No, you just see instantly that five is better than one. Intuition is the best word to describe the dozens or hundreds of rapid, effortless moral judgments and decisions that we all make every day. Only a few of these intuitions come to us embedded in full-blown emotions. In the happiness hypothesis, I called these two kinds of cognition the rider, controlled processes including reason and why, and the elephant, automatic processes including emotion, intuition, and all forms of seeing that. I chose an elephant rather than a horse because elephants are so much bigger and smarter than horses. Automatic processes run the human mind just as they have been running animal minds for 500 million years, so they're very good at what they do, like software that has been improved through thousands of product cycles. When human beings evolved the capacity for language and reasoning, at some point in the last million years, the brain did not rewire itself to hand over the reins to a new and inexperienced charioteer. Rather, the rider, language-based reasoning, evolved because it did something useful for the elephant. The rider can do several useful things. It can see further into the future because we can examine alternative scenarios in our heads. And therefore, it can help the elephant make better decisions in the present. It can learn new skills and master new technologies, which can be deployed to help the elephant reach its goals and sidestep disasters. And most important, the rider acts as the spokesman for the elephant, even though it doesn't necessarily know what the elephant is really thinking. The rider is skilled at fabricating post hoc explanations for whatever the elephant has just done, and it is good at finding reasons to justify whatever the elephant wants to do next. Once human beings developed language and began to use it to gossip about each other, it became extremely valuable for elephants to carry around on their backs a full-time public relations firm. I didn't have the rider and elephant metaphor back in the 1990s, but once I stopped thinking about emotion versus cognition and started thinking about intuition versus reasoning, everything fell into place. I took my old Jeffersonian dual process model and made two big changes to convert it into the social intuitionist model, which is shown in figure 2.4. You can see figure 2.4 in the accompanying PDF file, or you can download the file from the teaching company website or from righteousmind.com. In case you don't have access to the file right now, let me describe the figure. Imagine three circles in a horizontal row. The leftmost circle is labeled A's intuition, meaning the moral intuition experienced by person A. There's an arrow from that circle to the middle circle labeled A's judgment. This is the moral judgment that comes as a result of person A's intuition. Then there's the arrow from the middle circle to the right-hand circle labeled A's reasoning. The arrow connecting the circles is linked to the post hoc reasoning link. It shows that person A's judgment causes person A to engage in moral reasoning. There's also a reversed arrow, a dotted line running from A's reasoning back to A's judgment. That's link five, the reasoned judgment link. This is the first change I made to convert the Jeffersonian dual process model into the social intuitionist model. The dots mean that independently reasoned judgment is possible in theory, but rare in practice. This simple change converted the model into a Humean model in which intuition, rather than passion, is the main cause of moral judgment. That's link one. And then reasoning typically follows that judgment, link two, to construct post hoc justifications. Reason is the servant of the intuition. The rider was put there in the first place to serve the elephant. I also wanted to capture the social nature of moral judgment. Moral talk serves a variety of strategic purposes, such as managing your reputation, building alliances, and recruiting bystanders to support your side in the disputes that are so common in daily life. I wanted to go beyond the first judgments people make when they hear some juicy gossip or witness some surprising event. 
I wanted my model to capture the give and take, the round after round of discussion and argumentation that sometimes leads people to change their mind. We make our first judgments rapidly, and we are dreadful at seeking out evidence that might disconfirm those initial judgments. Yet friends can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. They can challenge us, giving us reasons and arguments that sometimes trigger new intuitions, thereby making it possible for us to change our mind. I therefore added in three more circles, showing what's happening in person B, the person you're talking to. So imagine three more circles in a row, below the three circles for person A. Only now, person B's intuition is on the right, person B's judgment is in the middle, and person B's reasoning is on the left. This allows the two people to create a loop. Imagine an arrow on the right side of the figure, from person A's reasoning down to person B's intuition. This is link three, the reasoned persuasion link. Person A gives reasons to person B, which triggers an intuitive response, which triggers a judgment, which triggers person B's reasoning, which person B gives to person A, and around and around it goes. We occasionally change our minds when mulling a problem by ourselves, suddenly seeing things in a new light or from a new perspective, to use two visual metaphors. Link six in the model represents this process of private reflection. It's a dotted line running from person A's reasoning back to person A's intuition. The line is dotted because this process doesn't seem to happen very often. For most of us, it's not every day or even every month that we change our minds about a moral issue without any prompting from anyone else. Okay, the figure is getting complicated, but it will all make sense when you get a chance to look at it. Far more common than such private mind changing is social influence. Other people influence us constantly just by revealing that they like or dislike somebody. That form of influence is link four, the social persuasion link. This is the last link you have to add to the model. It's a line running diagonally down to the right from person A's judgment directly to person B's intuition. Many of us believe that we follow an inner moral compass, but the history of social psychology richly demonstrates that other people exert a powerful force able to make cruelty seem acceptable and altruism seem embarrassing without giving us any reasons or arguments. Because of these two changes, I called my theory the social intuitionist model of moral judgment, and I published it in 2001 in an article titled The Emotional Dog and Its Rational Tale. In hindsight, I wish I'd called the dog intuitive, because psychologists who are still entrenched in the emotion versus cognition dichotomy often assume from the title that I'm saying that morality is always driven by emotion. Then they prove that cognition matters, and they think they have found evidence against intuitionism. But intuition, including emotional responses, are a kind of cognition. They're just not a kind of reasoning. How to win an argument. The social intuitionist model offers an explanation of why moral and political arguments are so frustrating. Because moral reasons are the tail wagged by the intuitive dog. A dog's tail wags to communicate. You can't make a dog happy by forcibly wagging its tail. And you can't change people's minds by utterly refuting their arguments. Hume diagnosed the problem long ago. Quote, And as reasoning is not the source whence either disputant derives his tenet, it is in vain to expect that any logic which speaks not to the affections will ever engage him to embrace sounder principles. End quote. If you want to change people's minds, you've got to use links three and four of the social intuitionist model to elicit new intuition, not new rationale. Dale Carnegie was one of the greatest elephant whisperers of all time. In his classic book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Carnegie repeatedly urged readers to avoid direct confrontation. Instead, he advised people to begin in a friendly way, to smile, to be a good listener, and to never say you're wrong. The persuader's goal should be to convey respect, warmth, and an openness to dialogue before stating one's own case. Carnegie was urging readers to use link three, the social persuasion link, to prepare the ground before attempting to use link four, the reasoned persuasion link. From my description of Carnegie so far, you might think his techniques are superficial and manipulative, appropriate only for salespeople. 
But Carnegie was, in fact, a brilliant moral psychologist who grasped one of the deepest truths about conflict. He used a quotation from Henry Ford to express it. Quote, if there is any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from their angle as well as your own, end quote. It's such an obvious point, yet few of us apply it in moral and political arguments because our righteous minds so readily shift into combat mode. The rider and the elephant work together smoothly to fend off attacks and lob rhetorical grenades of our own. The performance may impress our friends and show allies that we are committed members of the team, but no matter how good our logic, it's not gonna change the minds of our opponents if they are in combat mode too. If you really want to change someone's mind on a moral or political matter, you'll need to see things from that person's angle as well as your own. And if you do truly see it the other person's way, deeply and intuitively, you might even find your own mind opening in response. Empathy is an antidote to righteousness, although it's very difficult to empathize across a moral divide. In sum, people reason and people have moral intuitions, including moral emotions. But what is the relationship among these processes? Plato believed that reason could and should be the master. Jefferson believed that the two processes were equal partners, head and heart, ruling a divided empire. Hume believed that reason was and was only fit to be the servant of the passions. In this chapter, I tried to show that Hume was right. One, the mind is divided into parts like a rider, controlled processes, on an elephant, automatic processes. The rider evolved to serve the elephant. Two, you can see the rider serving the elephant when people are morally dumbfounded. They have a strong gut feeling about what is right and wrong, and they struggle to construct post hoc justifications for those feelings. Even when the servant, reasoning, comes back empty handed, the master, intuition, doesn't change his judgment. Three, the social intuitionist model starts with Hume's model and makes it more social. Moral reasoning is part of our lifelong struggle to win friends and influence people. That's why I say that intuitions come first, strategic reasoning second. You'll misunderstand moral reasoning if you think about it as something people do by themselves in order to figure out the truth. Four, therefore, if you want to change someone's mind about a moral or political issue, talk to the elephant first. If you ask people to believe something that violates their intuitions, they will devote their efforts to finding an escape hatch, a reason to doubt your argument or conclusion. They will almost always succeed. I have tried to use intuitionism while writing this book. My goal is to change the way a diverse group of readers, liberal and conservative, secular and religious, think about morality, politics, religion, and each other. I knew that I had to take things slowly and address myself more to elephants than to riders. I couldn't just lay out the theory in chapter one and then ask readers to reserve judgment until I had presented all of the supporting evidence. Rather, I decided to weave together the history of moral psychology and my own personal story to create a sense of movement from rationalism to intuitionism. I threw in historical anecdotes, quotations from the ancients, and praise of a few visionaries. I set up metaphors, such as the rider and the elephant, that will recur throughout this program. I did these things in order to tune up your intuitions about moral psychology. If I have failed, and you have a visceral dislike of intuitionism or of me, then no amount of evidence I could present will convince you that intuitionism is correct. But if you now feel an intuitive sense that intuitionism might be true, then let's keep going. In the next two chapters, I'll address myself more to rioters than to elephants. Chapter 3, Elephants Rule. On February 3rd, 2007, shortly before lunch, I discovered that I was a chronic liar. I was at home writing a review article on moral psychology when my wife, Jane, walked by my desk. In passing, she asked me not to leave dirty dishes on the counter where she prepared our baby's food. Her request was polite, but its tone added a postscript, as I have asked you a hundred times before. 
My mouth started moving before hers had stopped. Words came out. Those words linked themselves up to say something about the baby having woken up at the same time that our elderly dog barked to ask for a walk, and I'm sorry, but I, I just put my breakfast dishes down wherever I could. In my family, caring for a hungry baby and an incontinent dog is a surefire excuse, so I was acquitted. Jane left the room, and I continued working. I was writing about the three basic principles of moral psychology. The first principle is, intuitions come first, strategic reasoning second. That's a six-word summary of the social intuitionist model. To illustrate the principle, I described a study I did with Talia Wheatley, who is now a professor at Dartmouth College. Back when Talia was a grad student at UVA, she had learned how to hypnotize people, and she came up with a clever way to test the social intuitionist model. Talia hypnotized people to feel a flash of disgust whenever they saw a certain word, take for half the subject, often for the other. While they were still in a trance, Tali instructed them that they would not be able to remember anything she had told them, and then she brought them out of the trance. Once they were fully awake, we asked them to fill out a questionnaire packet in which they had to judge six short stories about moral violations. For each story, half of the subjects read a version that had their hypnotic code word embedded in it. For example, one story was about a congressman who claims to fight corruption, yet takes bribes from the tobacco lobby. The other subject read a version that was identical except for a few words. The congressman is often bribed by the tobacco lobby. On average, subjects judged each of the six stories to be more disgusting and morally wrong when their code word was embedded in the story. That supported the social intuitionist model. By giving people a little artificial flash of negativity while they were reading the story, without giving them any new information, we made their moral judgments more severe. The real surprise, though, came with the seventh story we tacked on almost as an afterthought, a story that contained no moral violation of any kind. It was about a student council president named Dan, who was in charge of scheduling discussions between students and faculty. Half of our subjects read that Dan tries to take topics that appeal to both professors and students in order to stimulate discussion. The other half read the same story, except that Dan often picks topics that appeal to professors and students. We added this story to demonstrate that there is a limit to the power of intuition. We predicted that subjects who felt a flash of disgust while reading the story would have to overrule their gut feeling. To condemn Dan would be bizarre. Most of our subjects did indeed say that Dan's actions were fine. But a third of the subjects who had found their code word in the story still followed their gut feelings and condemned Dan. They said that what he did was wrong, sometimes very wrong. Fortunately, we had asked everyone to write a sentence or two explaining their judgments, and we found gems such as, Dan is a popularity-seeking snob, and, I don't know, it just seems like he's up to something. These subjects made up absurd reasons to justify judgments that they had made on the basis of gut feelings, feelings Talia had implanted with hypnosis. So there I was at my desk, writing about how people automatically fabricate justifications of their gut feelings when suddenly I realized that I had just done the same thing with my wife. I disliked being criticized, and I had felt a flash of negativity by the time Jane had gotten to her third word. Can you not? Even before I knew why she was criticizing me, I knew I disagreed with her because intuitions come first. The instant I knew the content of the criticism, leave dirty dishes on the... My inner lawyer went to work searching for an excuse, strategic reasoning second. It's true that I had eaten breakfast, given Max his first bottle, and let Andy out for his first walk, but these events had all happened at separate times. Only when my wife criticized me did I merge them into a composite image of a harried father with too few hands, and I created this fabrication by the time she had completed her one-sentence criticism, counter where I make baby food. I then lied so quickly and convincingly that my wife and I both believed me. I had long teased my wife for altering stories to make them more dramatic when she told them to friends, but it took 20 years of studying moral psychology to see that I altered my stories too. I finally understood, not just cerebrally, but intuitively and with an open heart, the admonitions of sages from so many eras and cultures warning us about self-righteousness. I've already quoted Jesus on seeing the speck in your neighbor's eye. Here's the same idea from Buddha. Quote, 
It is easy to see the faults of others, but difficult to see one's own faults. One shows the faults of others like chaff winnowed in the wind, but one conceals one's own faults as a cunning gambler conceals his dice." End quote. Jesus and Buddha were right, and in this chapter and the next one, I'll show you how our automatic self-righteousness works. It begins with rapid and compelling intuition. That's link one in the social intuitionist model. And it continues on with post hoc reasoning done for socially strategic purposes. That's links two and three. Here are six major research findings that collectively illustrate the first half of the first principle. Intuitions come first. In the next chapter, I'll give evidence for the second half. Strategic reasoning second. Elephants rule although they are sometimes open to persuasion by riders. Research finding number one, brains evaluate instantly and constantly. Brains evaluate everything in terms of potential threat or benefit to the self, and then adjust behavior to get more of the good stuff and less of the bad. Animal brains make such appraisals thousands of times a day with no need for conscious reasoning, all in order to optimize the brain's answer to the fundamental question of animal life, approach or avoid. In the 1890s, Wilhelm Wundt, the founder of experimental psychology, formulated the doctrine of affective primacy. Affect refers to small flashes of positive or negative feeling that prepare us to approach or avoid something. Every emotion, such as happiness or disgust, includes an affective reaction, but most of our affective reactions are too fleeting to be called emotions. For example, the subtle feelings you get just from hearing the words happiness and disgust. Wundt said that affective reactions are so tightly integrated with perception that we find ourselves liking or disliking something the instant we notice it, sometimes even before we know what it is. These flashes occur so rapidly that they precede all other thoughts about the thing we're looking at. You can feel affective primacy in action the next time you run into someone you haven't seen in many years. You'll usually know within a second or two whether you liked or disliked the person, but it can take much longer to remember who the person is or how you know each other. In 1980, social psychologist Robert Zions revived Wundt's long forgotten notion of affective primacy. Zions was fed up with the common view among psychologists at the time that people are cool, rational information processors who first perceive and categorize objects and then react to them. He did a number of ingenious experiments that asked people to rate arbitrary things, such as Japanese pictograms, words in a made-up language, and geometric shapes. It may seem odd to ask people to rate how much they like foreign words and meaningless squiggles, but people can do it because almost everything we look at triggers a tiny flash of affect. More important, Zions was able to make people like any word or image more just by showing it to them several times. The brain tags familiar things as good things. Zions called this the mere exposure effect, and it is a basic principle of advertising. In a landmark article, Zions urged psychologists to use a dual process model in which affect or feeling is the first process. It has primacy both because it happens first, it is part of perception and is therefore extremely fast, and because it is more powerful it is closely linked to motivation, and therefore it strongly influences behavior. The second process, thinking, is an evolutionarily newer ability, rooted in language and not closely related to motivation. In other words, thinking is the rider, affect is the elephant. The thinking system is not equipped to lead. It simply doesn't have the power to make things happen. But it can be a useful advisor. Zions said that thinking could work independently of feeling in theory, but in practice, effective reactions are so fast and compelling that they act like blinders on a horse. They reduce the universe of alternatives available to later thinking. The rider is an attentive servant, always trying to anticipate the elephant's next move. If the elephant leans even slightly to the left, as though preparing to take a step, the rider looks to the left and starts preparing to assist the elephant on its imminent leftward journey. The rider loses interest in everything off to the right. Research finding number two. Social and political judgments are particularly intuitive. Here are four pairs of words. Your job is to listen only to the second word in each pair 
and then categorize it as good or bad. Flower happiness, hate sunshine, love cancer, cockroach lonely. It's absurdly easy, but imagine if I ask you to do it on a computer where I can flash the first word in each pair for 250 milliseconds, a quarter of a second, just long enough to read it. And then I immediately display the second word. In that case, we'd find that it takes you longer to make your value judgment for sunshine and cancer than for happiness and lonely. This effect is called affective priming because the first word triggers a flash of affect that primes the mind to go one way or the other. It's like getting the elephant to lean slightly to the right or the left in anticipation of walking to the right or the left. The flash kicks in within 200 milliseconds and it lasts for about a second beyond that if there's no other jolt to back it up. If you see the second word within that brief window of time, and if the second word has the same valence, then you'll be able to respond extra quickly because your mind is already leaning that way. But if the first word primes your mind for a negative evaluation, hate, and I then show you a positive word, sunshine, it'll take you about 250 milliseconds longer to respond because you have to undo the lean towards negativity. So far, this is just a confirmation of Zions' theory about the speed and ubiquity of affect. But a big payoff came when social psychologists began using social groups as primes. Would it affect your response speed if I used photographs of black people and white people as the primes? As long as you're not prejudiced, it won't affect your reaction time. But if you do prejudge people implicitly, that is, automatically and unconsciously, then those prejudgments include affective flashes, and those flashes will change your reaction time. The most widely used measure of these implicit attitudes is the Implicit Association Test, the IAT, developed by Tony Greenwald, Mazarin Banaji, and my UVA colleague, Brian Nozick. You can take the IAT yourself at projectimplicit.org, but be forewarned, it can be disturbing. You can actually feel yourself moving more slowly when you are asked to associate good things with the faces of one race rather than another. You can watch as your implicit attitude contradicts your explicit values. Most people turn out to have negative implicit associations with many social groups, such as black people, immigrants, obese people, and the elderly. And if the elephant tends to lean away from groups such as the elderly, whom few would condemn morally, then we should certainly expect some leaning or prejudging when people think about their political enemies. To look for such effects, my UVA colleague Jamie Morris measured the brain waves of liberals and conservatives as they read politically loaded words. He replaced the words flower and hate in the example I read you before with words such as Clinton, Bush, flag, taxes, welfare, and pro-life. When partisans read these words, followed immediately by words that everyone agrees are good, like sunshine, or bad, like cancer, their brains sometimes reveal the conflict. Pro-life and sunshine were effectively incongruous for liberals, just as Clinton and sunshine were for conservatives. The words pro and life are both positive on their own, but part of what it means to be a partisan is that you have acquired the right set of intuitive reactions to hundreds of words and phrases. Your elephant knows which way to lean in response to terms such as pro-life. And as your elephant sways back and forth throughout the day, you find yourself liking and trusting the people around you who sway in sync with you. The intuitive nature of political judgments is even more striking in the work of Alex Todorov at Princeton. Todorov studies how we form impressions of people. When he began his work, there was already a lot of research showing that we judge attractive people to be smarter and more virtuous, and we are more likely to give a pretty face the benefit of any doubt. Juries are more likely to acquit attractive defendants, and when beautiful people are convicted, judges give them lighter sentences on average. That's normal effective primacy, making everyone lean toward the defendant, which tips off their riders to interpret the evidence in a way that will support the elephant's desire to acquit. But Todorov found that there was more going on than just attractiveness. He collected photographs of the winners and runners-up in hundreds of elections for the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives. He showed people the pairs of photographs from each contest with no information about political parties, and he asked them to pick which person seemed more competent. He found that the candidate that people judged more competent 
was the one who actually won the race about two-thirds of the time. People's snap judgments of the candidate's physical attractiveness and overall likability were not as good predictors of victory. So these competence judgments were not just based on an overall feeling of positivity. We can have multiple intuitions arising simultaneously, each one processing a different kind of information. And strangely, when Todorov forced people to make their competence judgments after flashing the pair of pictures on the screen for just a tenth of a second, not long enough to let their eyes fixate on each image, their snap judgments of competence predicted the real outcomes just as well. Whatever the brain is doing, it's doing it instantly, just like when you look at the Muller liar illusion. The bottom line is that human minds, like animal minds, are constantly reacting intuitively to everything they perceive and basing their responses on those reactions. Within the first second of seeing, hearing, or meeting another person, the elephant has already begun to lean toward or away, and that lean influences what you think and do next. Intuitions come first. Research finding number three, our bodies guide our judgments. One way to reach the elephant is through its trunk. The olfactory nerve carries signals about odors to the insular cortex, also known as the insula, a region along the bottom surface of the frontal part of the brain. This part of the brain used to be known as the gustatory cortex because in all mammals it processes information from the nose and the tongue. It helps guide the animals toward the right foods and away from the wrong ones. But in humans, this ancient food processing center has taken on new duties and it now guides our taste in people. It gets more active when we see something morally fishy, particularly something disgusting, as well as garden variety unfairness. If we had some sort of tiny electrode that could be threaded up through people's noses and into their insulas, we could then control their elephant, making them steer away from whatever they were viewing at the moment when we pressed the button. We've got such an electrode. It's called fart spray. Alex Jordan, a grad student at Stanford, came up with the idea of asking people to make moral judgments while he secretly tripped their disgust alarms. He stood at a pedestrian intersection on the Stanford campus and asked passers-by to fill out a short survey. It asked people to make judgments about four controversial issues, such as marriage between first cousins or a film studio's decision to release a documentary with a director who had tricked some people into being interviewed. Alex stood right next to a trash can he had emptied. Before he recruited each subject, he put a new plastic liner into the metal can. Before half of the people walked up, and before they could see him, he sprayed the fart spray twice into the bag, which perfumed the whole intersection for a few minutes. Before other recruitment, he left the empty bag unsprayed. Sure enough, people made harsher judgments when they were breathing in foul air. Other researchers have found the same effect by asking subjects to fill out questionnaires after drinking bitter versus sweet drinks. As my UVA colleague Jerry Clore puts it, we use affect as information. When we're trying to decide what we think about something, we look inward at how we're feeling. If I'm feeling good, I must like it. And if I'm feeling anything unpleasant, that must mean I don't like it. You don't even need to trigger feelings of disgust to get these effects. Simply washing your hands will do it. Chen Bo Zhang at the University of Toronto has shown that subjects who are asked to wash their hands with soap before filling out questionnaires become more moralistic about issues related to moral purity, such as pornography and drug use. Once you're clean, you want to keep dirty things far away. Zhang has also shown the reverse process. Immorality makes people want to get clean. People who are asked to recall their own moral transgressions or merely to copy by hand an account of someone else's moral transgression find themselves thinking about cleanliness more often and wanting more strongly to cleanse themselves. They are more likely to select hand wipes and other cleaning products when given a choice of consumer products to take home with them after the experiment. Zhang calls this the Macbeth effect, named for Lady Macbeth's obsession with water and cleansing after she goads her husband into murdering King Duncan. She goes from, a little water clears us of this deed, to, out damned spot, out I say. In other words, there's a two-way street between our bodies and our righteous minds. Immorality makes us feel physically dirty, and cleansing ourselves can sometimes make us more concerned about guarding our moral purity. In one of the most bizarre demonstrations of this effect, Eric Helzer and David Pizarro 
asked students at Cornell University to fill out surveys about their political attitudes while standing near or far from a hand sanitizer dispenser. Those told to stand near the sanitizer became temporarily more conservative. Moral judgment is not a purely cerebral affair in which we weigh concerns about harm, rights, and justice. It's a kind of rapid, automatic process more akin to the judgments animals make as they move through the world, feeling themselves drawn toward or away from various things. Moral judgment is mostly done by the elephant. Research finding number four, psychopaths reason but don't feel. Roughly one in a hundred men, and many fewer women, are psychopaths. Most are not violent, but the ones who are commit nearly half of the most serious crimes, such as serial murder, serial rape, and the killing of police officers. Robert Hare, a leading researcher, defines psychopathy by two sets of features. There's the unusual stuff that psychopaths do, impulsive antisocial behavior beginning in childhood, and there are the moral emotions that psychopaths lack, they feel no compassion, guilt, shame, or even embarrassment, which makes it easy for them to lie and to hurt family, friends, and animals. Psychopaths do have some emotions. When Hare asked one man if he ever felt his heart pound or stomach churn, he responded, Of course, I'm not a robot. I really get pumped up when I have sex or when I get into a fight. But psychopaths don't show emotions that indicate that they care about other people. Psychopaths seem to live in a world of objects some of which happened to walk around on two legs. One psychopath told Hare about a murder he committed while burglarizing an elderly man's home. I was rummaging around when this old geezer comes downstairs and uh, he starts yelling and having a fucking fit. So I pop him one in the uh, head and he still doesn't shut up. So I give him a chop to the throat and he like staggers back and falls on the floor. He's gurgling and making sounds like a stuck pig and he's really getting on my fucking nerves. So I uh, boot him a few times in the head that shut him up. I'm pretty tired by now, so I grab a few beers from the fridge and turn on the TV and fall asleep. The cops woke me up. The ability to reason, combined with a lack of moral emotions, is dangerous. Psychopaths learn to say whatever gets them what they want. The serial killer Ted Bundy, for example, was a psychology major in college, where he volunteered on a crisis hotline. On those phone calls, he learned how to speak to women and gain their trust. Then he raped, mutilated, and murdered at least 30 young women before being captured in 1978. Psychopathy does not appear to be caused by poor mothering or early trauma or to have any other nurture-based explanation. It's a genetically heritable condition that creates brains that are unmoved by the needs, suffering, or dignity of others. The elephant doesn't respond with the slightest lean to the gravest injustice. The rider is perfectly normal. He does strategic reasoning quite well. But the rider's job is to serve the elephant, not to act as a moral compass. Research finding number five. Babies feel, but don't reason. Psychologists used to assume that infant minds were blank slates. The world babies enter is one great blooming, buzzing confusion, as William James put it, and they spend the next few years trying to make sense of it all. But when developmental psychologists invented ways to look into infant minds, they found a great deal of writing already on that slate. The trick was to see what surprises babies. Infants as young as two months old will look longer at an event that surprises them than at an event they were expecting. If everything is a buzzing confusion, then everything should be equally surprising. But if the infant's mind comes already wired to interpret events in certain ways, then infants can be surprised when the world violates their expectations. Using this trick, psychologists discovered that infants are born with some knowledge of physics and mechanics. They expect that objects will move according to Newton's laws of motion, and they get startled when psychologists show them scenes that should be physically impossible, such as a toy car seeming to pass through a solid object. Psychologists know this because infants stare longer at impossible scenes than at similar but less magical scenes such as seeing the toy car pass just behind the solid object. Babies seem to have some innate ability to process events in their physical world, the world of objects. But when psychologists dug deeper, they found that infants come equipped with innate abilities to understand their social world as well. They understand things like harming and helping. 
Yale psychologists Kylie Hamlin, Karen Wynn, and Paul Bloom put on puppet shows for six and 10 month old infants in which a climber, a wooden shape with eyes glued to it, struggled to climb up a hill. Sometimes a second puppet came along and helped the climber from below. Other times a different puppet appeared at the top of the hill and repeatedly bashed the climber down the slope. A few minutes later, the infant saw a new puppet show. This time, the climber looked back and forth between the helper puppet and the hinderer puppet, and then it decided to cozy up to the hinderer. To the infant, that was the social equivalent of seeing a car pass through a solid box. It made no sense, and the infant stared longer than when the climber decided to cozy up to the helper. At the end of the experiment, the helper and hinderer puppets were placed on a tray in front of the infant. The infants were much more likely to reach out to the helper. If the infants weren't parsing their social world, they wouldn't have cared which puppet they picked up. But they clearly wanted the nice puppet. The researchers concluded that, quote, the capacity to evaluate individuals on the basis of their social interactions is universal and unlearned, end quote. It makes sense that infants can easily learn who is nice to them. Puppies can do that too. But these findings suggest that by six months of age, Infants are watching how people behave toward other people, and they are developing a preference for those who are nice rather than those who are mean. In other words, the elephant begins making something like moral judgments during infancy, long before language and reasoning arrive. Looking at the discoveries from infants and psychopaths at the same time, it's clear that moral intuitions emerge very early and are necessary for moral development. The ability to reason emerges much later and when moral reasoning is not accompanied by moral intuition, the results are ugly. Research finding number six, effective reactions are in the right place at the right time in the brain. Damasio's studies of brain damaged patients show that the emotional areas of the brain are the right places to be looking for the foundations of morality because losing them interferes with moral competence. The case would be even stronger if these areas were active at the right times. Do they become more active just before someone makes a moral judgment or decision? In 1999, Joshua Green, who was then a graduate student in philosophy at Princeton, teamed up with leading neuroscientist Jonathan Cohen 